Hello everyone and welcome to STEAM in Literacy Instruction. I'm so happy that you are here and you've signed up for this session. Um, it makes me super excited that you are eager to learn about STEM as much as I am eager to talk about it. So thank you so much. I know that this is a little bit of an unconventional way for us to do things, but you know what? When life hands you lemons, We'll just do it online. So welcome. Um, we're going to talk about so many things within this presentation. I'm going to start by talking about the difference between STEM and STEAM and why it's so important to really give the arts that recognition within STEM that they truly deserve. Um, we'll also talk about the research and beliefs um, behind STEM education or STEAM education. We'll go through some engineering design plans and the process of engineering. I will share with you some of my precious little ones that have done so many STEM projects with me in my classroom over the past 13 years. Um, I'll also share with you some engineering resources and materials for you. Of course, some picture book resources, which is probably the reason that you guys are all here. Um, a sample plan that you could do with your students, and then also some thank you gifts for attending. So that'll be at the very end. So we are going to go ahead and get started here. Um, first of all, welcome. I'm Jamie Perchinski. This is my 13th year teaching, and I really couldn't imagine doing anything else. I've been fortunate enough that I was introduced to STEM about 12 years ago um, when I worked at a STEM school in Tennessee. So that's really where my love for STEM education began. Um, I'm truly thankful to them because they really were the ones that got the ball rolling for me and made me realize how important and valuable STEM education was. Um, so I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, go Steelers, we are seven and zero. Yay, undefeated. Um, so I'm obviously in North Carolina now. Um, I'm national board teacher. I know I'm kind of skipping around. I'm just eager to get started. Um, so I cannot wait to share my passion with you um, about STEM and STEAM education. And I hope that you are just as excited to take all of these things back to your classroom. So this is a quote from Grace Hopper. And if you don't know who Grace Hopper is, she was one of the first female coders. Um, I'm actually going to share a resource with you based around a book that was written about her. Humans are allergic to change. They like to always say, we've always done it this way. We should all try to fight that. And I actually think this is an amazing quote to really think about how life has changed in the past eight months. Um, you know, we have all been so inventive and creative and resourceful with how we've been able to do things, not only in our classroom, but, you know, contacting our friends and family and visiting them without necessarily visiting them. Um, so this quote, you know, she said umpteen years ago is so relevant in our world today. But it's just so important as teachers for us to really get away from this way of thinking, because I know that we know the way that we were taught and why broke what's not why fix what's not broken? Um, you know, but the world is changing. There's so many innovations that are, you know, coming in this day and age and just the way that children are brought up and things that they're used to and ways that they learn that we also need to change with those times. I know for some of us, we are all creatures of habit as humans, um, but we just really have to come to terms with that. So I love, love, love this quote. So what is STEAM? Well, if you are brand new to STEAM or STEM education, you, you might not know, um, but if you are familiar with it, you probably know that S stands for science, T is technology, engineering, and math. But whenever we talk about STEAM education, like I said, the, the terms are really reciprocal. I just truly believe that we need to be giving the arts, um, like I said before, that recognition. Because when you really look at engineering and STEM, there is so, so much art that is going into this. Um, and the art teachers, I'm sure, would totally agree. I know that STEM just kind of naturally rolls off the tongue better, like I said before. I do that all the time. We talk about, we just say STEM and STEAM, you know, and it's the same thing. But I think it might be important for us to really get into that habit of just referring to it as STEM. STEM. Um, because we want to recognize the arts. So that's really the main difference. So why should we add the arts? So many reasons. Children can express themselves in more variations. For example, drawing, painting, sculpting, music, movement, video, just to name a few. All of those things are going to kind of resonate with different children um, in different ways. 
So they might be able to express themselves more openly with drawing or maybe making or writing music. So we really need to give children that opportunity to show what they know using these different methods of art. Also, whenever we add the arts, it includes all students in your classroom. It makes learning accessible for any student with disabilities. They can show what they know beyond paper and pencil learning. So many of us get wrapped up in, oh, well, I teach third grade and it's a tested subject. Oh, well, we have to take the end of grade test. Yes, I understand that. But in the next few slides, I'm actually going to show you that you are going to get more bang for your buck whenever you are incorporating STEAM education in your classroom. Um, so, you know, a student who's not necessarily a great writer, they can still represent themselves and show what they know if you allow them to draw something. Um, so it's really important, like I said, to not only add those arts in there, but to give children the option of how do I want to represent my learning instead of always doing the same thing all the time. The arts also encourages learners to connect to the content. It allows students to envision things in a different way. It also provides opportunities for both sides of the brain to engage. So instead of just thinking about that analytical part, you're really, really tapping into that creative piece. I don't know about you, but I know that growing up, that's all my sisters and I did was we created things. We would walk across the field to my grandfather's house, we would borrow his video camera, and we had the best time with that thing over the entire weekend. We would make videos and commercials and interviews um, because we didn't have access to a video camera every day. So we just thought it was kind of the, the coolest thing ever. So creativity has always been kind of in my blood since I was a kid because that's just how we grew up. Kids today, as we all know, are more into the technological piece, the video games, the Snapchatting if your kids are older, um, you know, Instagram or Roblox, which, which are great. I'm not dogging Roblox at all, but they are not tapping into that creative part of their brain as much as maybe we did whenever we were kids. And it is extremely unfortunate. It is extremely difficult to teach creativity. However, with STEAM education, it's naturally going to build for them and they are going to learn from their mistakes, making them more creative, seeing what they're able to build, seeing what their friends are building. And then in turn, that is going to build upon their creativity. Um, this is probably my most passionate part of STEAM learning is that we have to teach our kids to be creative. Um, they are just not getting that if they're not getting it at home or in their, you know, in their childhoods, that's our job. That is our job to kind of boost their creative minds. So I'm going to get off my soapbox on that one. Um, the arts also engage the brain and it develops cognitive growth. Hello, that's what I'm talking about for our end of grade tests. So yes, I know that we have a curriculum that we need to get, th get through um, in order for us to feel accomplished for the end of grade test, but doing this STEAM learning, it is building that brain development. And so they are going to connect and they are learning. Um, in the latter part of this presentation, I'll go through different um, concepts in literacy that you can use um, to kind of get, like I said, get a bigger bang for your buck and kind of intertwine all of these things together. You know, your literacy, your math, your STEAM, your science, all of those things. So Super, super important. This is research-based as well. I'm not making these things up, I promise you. It improves long-term memory. How many of us cannot believe that our kids forget something that you just told them? It is, it is crazy because they're constantly on their phone or their computer, um, and it's just everything is so automatic to them. And I'm sorry, I'm not trying to dog parents at all, but a lot of times parents do these things for their kids. So their kids are not learning from their mistakes and they're not having to remember anything because their parents are doing it for them. Like I said, not dogging you parents, I promise. But it's just, this is how the, the world has become. Everyone is so busy and it's easier for you to just tell your child or for you to just do it yourself. Trust me, I, I get it. Of course, the arts promotes creativity and it reduces stress. How many of you have anxious students in your classroom? It is crazy to me, crazy to me. The majority of my teaching career has been in second grade. 
And I cannot believe the amount of children that would come to me that would have anxiety or stress over school and schoolwork. And that is just something that should not be in any any grade, but definitely the elementary level. Um, So promoting this STEAM, doing something once a week if you're able to, is going to reduce that stress within your classroom. And honestly, STEAM days were my most favorite days because I could just walk around the classroom and honestly just hang out with my kids. I just got to to talk to them and question them and it was it was just so enjoyable for me as a teacher. So again, these are all research-based reasons. So whenever you go back to your schools, if there's someone who is totally not on board with this, please pull up these red slides because This is the most meaningful part to me of STEM education. I'm going to go through more as well um, on the next few slides, but I just think that these are super important in the 21st century. So here are some STEAM beliefs that we really need to think about whenever we are starting to do our STEM education. Or maybe this is great for someone who's not really on board with adding STEAM into their into their classroom. So companies are looking for creativity. That's why I said it is so important for us to teach our children to be creative. Because in so many jobs now, you have to be creative. That is what they're looking for. It is so competitive out there in the working world that someone who um, you know has a 4.0 and compared to someone else with a 4.0, they're going to go with the person who has that creativity um, to offer. So that they're looking for that much more than achievement, believe it or not. Learning should be active. We all know that. And it should be active with students constructing their own learning. We really need to get away from the teacher in the front of the classroom delivering lectures for 45 to 60 minutes. The, the students really need to be active with constructing their own learning, learning from their mistakes, figuring things out on their own, problem solving. All of that is so important and students are going to learn 10 times better whenever they are engaged um, and managing their own learning. Learning moves to divergent thinking instead of convergent, allowing for more problem solving based skills. Again, our kids are not problem solvers. Unfortunately, they're not. I've seen my sister do it. She solves her kids problems for them. And we get on her all the time because in 10 years, they're not going to know how to figure out a problem for themselves. So this is super important that we are focusing on this problem solving within our classroom. And of course, STEAM education is just going to do that automatically for you. So one and done. Um, Of course, it is an infusion of subjects that will support learning for those that are creative and logical thinkers. I have had some of the most creative kids, and I've had some of the most logical thinking kids that you can imagine. And let me tell you, whenever we first started some STEAM projects, my logical thinkers hated them. Hated them because they never had to work through a problem whenever they weren't successful. They were so quick to always get answers correct, no matter what the subject was. But here, you're having to go through a process and problem solve. After about, I would say a month and a half to two months, they they then loved it and would, we would kind of tease each other and go back and forth and say, remember whenever you didn't like STEAM projects? And they would say, I know, that's not true. Um, so it's really, really entertaining to kind of see the differences in your kids whenever you start these projects. Now, the arts take STEM to a whole new level, allowing for creativity, imagination, and collaboration. Again, that imagination is so hard to teach. But once you do these projects, it's just going to naturally ignite something in your kids. And they're going to see, oh my gosh, and they're going to come up with all of these ideas because it's just going to come natural to them. It is it is amazing to see. It is amazing. I'm so excited for you guys to start these things with your kids hopefully tomorrow. This is the craziest thing. 1.2 million jobs opening in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math in the future. I know that you have heard that statistic of there are jobs that these kids are going to be applying for that don't even exist yet. I always try to think about that whenever I'm thinking about how I teach in my classroom. 
1.2 million jobs in these areas. And I don't know about you, but whenever you are teaching and you don't have time, what's the one thing that gets cut? Probably science and social studies, right? It's okay. You can be honest. Trust me. Been there. Done it. This is why the infusion of STEAM is so important because you can hit all of these things and it's honestly no extra work for you. I promise. Trust me, I will not lead you astray. So the mindset of STEAM making, it teaches students that they can get better. One part of the engineering design process, and we'll talk about that in a minute, is improvement. So many of my kids would not want to improve anything about whatever our, our engineering project was. Um, this teaches them that actually, yes, you can. You can always improve. It also teaches them that um, you know teachers and students can build qualities of perseverance and persistence when they're faced with challenges. It teaches them to persevere through things that are challenging. Hello, growth mindset. How many of us teach growth mindset in our classrooms? Exactly. This is all connected. It's not anything new that you're having to do or teach. Engagement is high and students are focused. If you would come into my classroom whenever there was a STEAM project going on, my kids wouldn't even know that you came into the room. Or if I were to leave the room, they would not know that I had left the room unless they wanted to show me something and I was nowhere to be found. Because they are so engrossed in what they are doing that they are, it, it is, the engagement level is out of this world. It is through the roof. Um, and of course, this occurs when students have a choice in what they are learning. So whenever you're allowing them to choose what they want to do to represent their learning, of course, the engagement is going to be that much higher. The tasks tap into student curiosity and allow creativity to shine. These tasks require critical thinking and problem solving skills. That goes back to teaching content. We want our kids to connect and remember content, right? Well, incorporating STEAM education, it is going to naturally do that. So it is building that critical thinking and those problem solving skills that our kids so badly need these days. Oh, it's so crazy. <sighs> okay, guys, gonna get real for a second. And please don't run and tell that we're talking about the F word, okay? I know it's a very sensitive subject, but I'm from the North, so we talk about it a lot. That F word being failure. How often do we set students up to fail? I was trying not to spill the tea on the last few slides when I was talking about my kiddos that were the logical thinkers that didn't necessarily like our STEM projects because they never failed. They never failed at anything that they've ever done. That's why they didn't like them because they were having that sense of failure for the first time. What's going to happen when these children have been in school, I'm going to say for six or seven years, then they go to middle school or high school and they come to a problem and they're not successful or they don't get that A on the test or they don't get into this club that they wanted to get into or they didn't make this team. They're going to shut down. My sister works in HR and she tells me this firsthand. It is, it is crazy. We have to set kids up to fail as crazy as that sounds. I'm not saying it in a bad way. I'm saying it for a learning opportunity because the world needs problem solvers. Acquiring knowledge in steam making comes from exploration and inquiry, not a textbook. No matter what way you want to put it, it just it doesn't happen. Teaching students to be technology literate will help prepare students for the real world. Collaborate, use data, fail, and then recover. That's kind of the process that they're using um, for all of these STEM or STEAM projects. I'm sure that all of our kiddos are becoming technology literate at this point, um, just because of everything that went on in March, and then our virtual students that we have learning now, I'm sure that they have figured out technology. And whenever I talk about using technology, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're giving them something to do, um, you know, on an iPad or they're just they're doing something on the computer. It's really making meaningful connections to how is this project? How can I use technology to help me figure out this problem? So it's really making technology meaningful in these projects and not just 
okay, well, um, we're going to get on this website and we're going to call it a day. Of course, yes, there's nothing wrong with that. And I am going to share some websites, of course, that we've used. Um, but it's really teaching them, how can I publish my learning using technology? Or how can I use technology to my advantage to help me figure out this problem or be sick or to be successful in this problem? So I know that whenever you start these projects, like I said, we've done them once a week for the entire, for the start of the school years when we start for the past, like I said, 12 years of my teaching career. And you will have students that say all of these things. So as a teacher, sometimes you might not know, okay, well, and you automatically wanna help them. You don't know how to talk them through these problems. So I have some suggestions for you. This is a great slide that you could print out um, and you could take it with you whenever you're walking around for their first or STEAM project or two to kind of help you like a little cheat sheet or cliff notes. So if a student might say, I don't know what to make, that's probably the, the most common question that you'll get. You can tell them, okay, let's brainstorm. Let's make a list. Let's plan it. Let's sketch it. So that's part of their active engagement. It's really getting them to think and you're not telling them what to do. You're just kind of probing them or prompting them. Okay, let's brainstorm. Let's think about blah, 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 whatever it is that your project is. <clears throat> they might say, oh, I'm stuck. If, if their problem isn't working or if their, their engineering project, I mean, if, if it's not working, they're going to say, oh my gosh, I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I, I can't figure it out. You can say, okay, well, let's research, let's think, let's communicate with our partner. This is flexible thinking. So it's getting them to kind of maybe look at what else is going on. What, where is the problem occurring? Because that's what we need to fix. So it's just kind of allowing them to backtrack and look at their steps um, to figure out where that problem is lying. Again, talking with your peers is so important. Um, they learn so much from each other, just like we learn so much from each other. Um, so this is really important. Anytime they might say, oh, I'm stuck, I can't figure this out. Just kind of, again, guide them through that process. This isn't turning out right. That's another thing you're going to hear all the time. Um, they can evaluate their materials that they've chosen. Make adjustments to your design or your plan. That's all part of perseverance. So instead of saying, now, one thing that I will say I'm going to kind of pause on this for a second, and I will talk about this again, but it is important whenever we go through the engineering design plan that they, or process, that they are able to change their plan. So we always want kids to map out what they're going to do first. Once they start the building process or the construction of the engineering plan, you want them to make changes because that means that they are learning while they're working. So I'm certainly not going to carry out this plan that I know is not going to work. So we want to allow them to make changes, okay? So that's why I'm saying allow them to evaluate their materials and to take a look at their design plan because something might just not be working there. Maybe you chose straws and they're way too flimsy or maybe you're out of tape. That was probably my my kids' biggest qualm with me is that I only gave them a certain amount of tape and they would run out all the time. And, and so they blamed me for a lot of their failures um, for their engineering plans because I wouldn't give them any more tape. <laughs> Um, you might have this, I'm done, I like what I made, I don't care what others think. Um, this is that improvement part that I was talking about, that the kids would say, oh yeah, I'm happy with it, I'm, it's good, it worked, so I don't want to change anything. Just because it worked doesn't mean there's nothing that you could improve upon. Every time I teach a lesson, I think about, okay, what could I do to make it better next time? That's just, nat it comes naturally to us as teachers. As kids, it might not so much already. Um, so talk to them about listening, questioning, communicating maybe with their partner or others, reflecting on exactly what their um, project was and how it turned out. Could you make it cleaner? Could you use less material? Something like that. Could you make it more colorful? Could it be more presentable? That's where those arts are going to come into play. Um, and then consider other options. So they're receptive to input. It's important for, again, kids to not think that they're perfect because a lot of the time they do, don't they? Um, so we want them to think about, okay, can always make things better, always. So let's pick one part. So which part could I maybe improve upon for next time? So if you are brand new to STEM or STEAM, you might not even know what the engineering design process is. Um, we start 
any engineering project that we do or STEAM project, we start with going through the engineering design process, which is ask, imagine, plan, create, and improve. So whenever you ask, you can ask, what is the problem that you are needing to solve? This is the question that you are presenting to students. For example, you might say, okay, we need to make a wind-powered Mayflower. The, how can we make a wind-powered um, Mayflower that can hold as many pilgrims as possible? That's our next um, STEAM project that's coming up. Um, so our kiddos are excited for that. So this is the question or the problem that they are needing to solve. Imagine, this is the most crucial step because it gets their brains warmed up. Think about what do you know about the topic and what do you need to know? Background knowledge is huge in this area. This is also where students can explore materials presented to determine what they would like to use in their plan. Research can also be done in this step. This is great for adding in those science standards for getting their brains warmed up. Well, what do I know about sinking and floating? What do I know about wind power? What do I know about friction? Things like that. So this is where you're connecting all of those skills that you have been teaching in class. Now, if there's a skill that they're going to need, this is the perfect time for you to do a quick little mini lesson. If you're going to do something with elapsed time or measuring, do a quick little mini lesson with that. And then, um, now obviously if it's something really difficult, I would not suggest doing that. Um, but if it's something that they haven't learned like measuring to the nearest inch, not a huge, huge difficult skill, then that can be something that can be done in a little mini lesson. So this is where you make your plan or when you make your plan. So many of the kids do not want to map out their plan because they just want to go ahead and get started. I would always have them show me their plan before they gathered their materials because I wanted to know that they had a plan in place of how they were going to go about this. I always try to tell them when I come into school every day, I don't just say, okay, we're just gonna see how this goes. I have my plan written out for each and every day in my lesson planner. This is exactly what you have to do, okay? So you have to have your students draw, label, list, or explain their plan of attack. I'm not saying they have to write a paragraph. They're going to make a little bulleted list of what materials they want, and then they're going to draw me a sketch and label it with a, with, and make a diagram by labeling it with their materials. I want them to really think about what they have going on before they just go ahead and start building. Okay, I want you to have a plan of attack. And the diagram is probably the easiest way to do this. It also connects to those text features again. Um, and it's something simple. The kids will kind of get used to it after a while, and then it just becomes automatic to them. So it does not have to be something that is completely lengthy, it's just, allowing them to really think about how am I going to make this work? Then comes the best part, the create and also test phase of the engineering plan. So this is where I had mentioned that if something is not working in their plan, please go ahead and change it. You don't necessarily have to recreate your plan, but in your improvement part, I do want you to reference that. So that's important for them to connect. So this is where you carry out your plan. Be sure to follow your blueprint as best as possible. Like I said, until something is going crazy you and you know that it's not working, you're going to change it. Students should follow their blueprint as best as possible. Students will be going um, through the whole process of asking, imagining, and planning. Um, and this is important for this step in the process this phase of the process. Sorry about that. I could not see the word in my slide. Um, so this is important that they're going to be using all of those things. They're constantly going to be asking and imagining and creating during the creative portion of this. It's almost like it should just be a continual arrow, arrow um, of this circle because they're going to be asking, okay, why isn't this working? Okay, thinking about how I can change it to make it work. Then they're going to create it and test it. If that doesn't work, they're going to go back and they're going to ask themselves again. So this, this portion, they're just kind of going back through asking, imagining, planning, creating, and testing the entire time until they have finished. Um, so it's important for them to know that because some of them might not think, okay, well, I'm just going to create it. And if it doesn't work, then it doesn't work. So we really want to guide them through that knowing you're going to have to go back and ask yourself again. 
Again, most important, well, not most important because they're all the most important, I think, but a super important part is to improve. How did your product work? What could you make better next time? What changes could you make to your design? I think that this is beneficial um, when you allow the other students to share what they have created because, again, our, our students are our best teachers at times. And so we learn from other teachers just like students learn from other students. Um, so it's important that you let your kids see what others have made um, because it might spark something in them and it will help them whenever they're thinking about what they would want to improve. So students will continually be in the improvement phase during the creation of their product. Um, they'll always go back after testing to reflect. So it's important not to skip over this, just like whenever you exercise, it's important to not skip over the stretching portion of your workout. We don't wanna skip over the improvement part either. Um, there's always things that we can improve upon, no matter what it is, no matter what we're talking about, whether we're talking about STEAM or something else in life, there's always things that you can improve upon. Here um, are some photographs of a project that my kiddos did last year. In second grade, we had did a unit of study on the Wizard of Oz. And so they had to create a bridge once we got to the portion of the novel where Dorothy, Toto, Scarecrow, Lion, and Tin Man came to a ditch in the road and they were not able to cross. So I had my students create a bridge um, that could hold all of the characters at one time. That was the mission, so they could all cross together. Um, but when we tested, we used, which I don't have a picture in here, but we used those little weights, um, they're stackable weights, to represent each character. So I had some that were super tiny, and we talked about, okay, so which character do you think would best be represented by this weight? You know, and everyone yelled, Toto, because he's so tiny. Okay, perfect. So we'll use this one for Toto. So we used it. We used our testing method. Um, we created what it would be together as a class. So also it was more meaningful for them. Um, but then they were using that creativity to figure out which weight would best represent each character. I will say it's also important for you to let your students know what you are using to test. So for example, they all knew that these weights were representing the characters. So they had to make sure that, you know, their their bridge was flat, that it would be able to hold them. Um, also for the Mayflower project that I was talking about earlier, we are using pennies to represent the pilgrims. So they have. it's important for them to know what material you are using um, for the testing portion of your project. So, I mean, just in this picture, <clears throat> you can just see the engagement and creativity going on. I mean, maybe I'm a little bit biased because they're my kiddos, um, but it's just so much fun to me to walk around and look at what they're creating. Now, I did spend a day, I believe it was during a science and social studies lesson, that we talked about different types of bridges. I had a picture book about bridges. Um, we watched a couple video clips about bridges so that they did have background knowledge of different types of bridges, um, how they were built, um, so that whenever they went to create theirs, that all went into the imagination part of their planning process. I wasn't just saying, okay, here, let's all make a bridge. You know, we talked about the suspension bridge um, and, and things like that. So, um, and you see that I did not use crazy expensive materials. Most of these things are donated by the parents in my classroom. A lot of these things we try to reuse. You can see the tape there. They they went all out for this one. They got their own roll of tape, probably because it was Wizard of Oz related, and that's one of my favorites. So I was feeling extra generous, I guess, for this project. Um, but it was just amazing to see their creativity, their teamwork, their collaboration. Um, and whenever we tested them and they were successful, everyone was excited for every single student in that class. It wasn't just, oh, I'm excited that my bridge worked. It was Oh my gosh, I'm so excited for you. Your bridge is awesome. So it just, it builds upon that classroom community too. There's so many things that STEAM does um, that you'll see once you start using it in your classroom, you're just going to say, why haven't I been doing this the entire time? <laughs> okay, I'm going to show you this video of this little cutie here on the right-hand side. 
This was a Thanksgiving dinner table project that we did last year. And let me tell you something, this was extremely challenging. I don't know if it was because it was towards the beginning of the year or what, but their mission was to construct a Thanksgiving dinner table that could hold all of our Thanksgiving dinner items. And you can see what they are here. I used leftover Halloween candy um, and taped some graphics over top of them to represent the food. So that your table had to hold as many food items as possible because of course for Thanksgiving dinner, you wanna have as many food items as you possibly can. Um, everyone was failing to try and hold up their food on their table was extremely challenging for them. Their tables would stand, but once they started to put that food on there, their legs would collapse. So this was the first group that was able to um, accomplish that goal and become successful. And this was his, um, his response. <laughs> Genuinely overjoyed that they got it to work. And you can see it is extremely structurally sound. They were constantly having to go back, ask, imagine, and improve. Test it. Ask again. Okay. The, the cycle continued. And whenever they were successful, which eventually they all did become successful um, because they realized, oh my gosh, well, the problem is I have to make my legs stronger. So once they kind of realized that, then, you know, it was a whole new ball game. These were so much fun. We made weather tools. In science, we researched weather tools and we were learning all about different weather tools. And then of course they had to choose one and create their own. Um, I have here in this picture, a scholastic set that um, a parent actually purchased for me from my wish list on Amazon. I believe it's called STEM. Um, I will have to look at the exact name of it, but they're just STEM cards. They have projects already on them. They have them for uh, K-5, so a great resource if you're coming, if you're having trouble coming up with lessons because it will be divided by subject area or um, strand in science, rather, so that you can look at your earth science and um, life science and things like that. So they had so much fun with these, and it was so fun to see their, just the creativity in everyone's different um, product. They were not all the same. And we did test them to, to see if they would work. And his anemometer did actually spin. It was really, really cool. Um, another awesome website that we use to research weather tools is Pebble Go. Unfortunately, they took away the 10 day free trial that you could have. But if your school is able to purchase it, I would highly suggest doing that. It is an amazing website. It's all science, social studies related. It reads the content aloud to the kids. There are so many different topics on there for them to choose from. So giving them that choice in what they want to research and produce. We've used it. I've been using it for 13 years and I hope that they never do away with it because it is amazing, amazing, amazing. Um, this here is a generic engineering plan. I have this on hand for, I'm gonna be completely honest, whenever I don't have time to make one specifically for this engineering project that we're doing, I will bust this one out and they write the ask question down themselves um, whenever we're starting the project. So you do not have to make something brand new every single time. You might be getting this at the end of our session, we'll see. Um, this was so much fun too. We did this before we went to the zoo. We read Gingerbread Man Loose at the Zoo. And um, of course we practiced some reading standards with it. And then we had to create an enclosure for the little Joey who escapes from the zoo. So we have to keep him safe in there. Um, you can see I used reusable materials for this. Nothing that was needing to be purchased separately. These were things that I already had in my classroom for math. Um, you can see that the creativity in this is, is mind blowing. I'm going to let my little Miss Maggie talk here. Um, I did not help with this at all. Her partner was the one that recorded her um, using Seesaw. If you're not using Seesaw, you are totally missing out. Um, you must be using it because it is amazing and it is free, but this is how the students um, showcased what they created and then we were able to watch it as a whole class. Um, so that we could see everyone's enclosures. So just listen to the creativity that is coming from this STEAM project. Hi, my name is Matthew. Today we have made a Joe enclosure. Here's our enclosure. This is where we will put him inside. This is his bush where he can snuggle in. His food. 
his meat, his plums, his carrots, his water, and of course his oranges. And now he will play all the way. And see this big block here? That is where the children will peek inside and he can play. And they can see him. Okay. Thank you for watching. Bye. Okay. First of all, that is the cutest thing ever, I think. But the creativity that went behind that is amazing. Her talking about the, the colors and you heard her partner whisper to her. She couldn't think about something that, you know, was orange. And she said, oranges. You know, so her partner is also getting in with this. Um, they had a choice, by the way, if they wanted to do the recording together or if they wanted to do a recording separately or if they did not want to do a recording at all. If they did not want to do a recording at all, I simply had them take a photograph of it and then they just did a voice recording of um, their explanation. So I did not force anyone to make a video if they didn't want to. That's part of that student choice. But I did give them an option because it wasn't just, oh, well, then you're not having to do anything. You know, that's important. Um, so not only is this talking about our creativity, but also our speaking and listening standards. You know, this is a little presentation that she was doing. Um, also her partner having to video that so that everyone was able to see. You know, I hate to say that it's a life skill, but it's just something that the kids are learning. Oh, okay, I want to show my classmates. So I have to make sure whenever she's talking that I'm showcasing that, that part. Um, all of these little things, life lessons that they just don't get taught. Um, but that, that video just, when I watched it for the first time, just melted my heart because I was just so proud and the creativity that goes into it is exactly what we're looking for. It's amazing. This, oh, this is another one of my favorite projects. We do a whole month long unit on fables and fairy tales. At the end of that unit, we celebrate by having a fairy tale ball. So with our social studies less, um, curriculum, we were focusing on maps at that point. So we had the kiddos make, choose a fairy tale land, and then they had to create a map using a set of criteria that we gave them. Also to connect it to literacy, we had them do a story retelling using emojis. So they could only use emojis starting at the beginning of the story all the way to the end. You can see this is my example here. Um, because of COVID, the kiddos did not get to this portion. They did not get to the full map creation. Um, but in years past, we've done it every year and they have so enjoyed this. But we used it with a robot called Sphero and he's actually created by the same people that made BB-8. So whenever you tell the kids that, they are just over the moon excited because of course everybody loves Star Wars and everybody loves BB-8. Um, but this video here, they were practicing with my map coding so that they could figure out how Spiro worked. So whenever they were creating theirs, we put, we had them use a um, certain number of stopping points. I believe it was five. They had to have five, four or five stopping points. Um, so you can see I did Goldilocks and you can see the different areas. Um, so this was after, I'm going to say maybe, maybe 10 minutes of working with Spiro. Um, this is what this group was able to accomplish. Start here. Awesome. There's my annoying teacher voice. Sorry about that. Sounds like whenever I talk to my dogs. Um, but they had to code all of that. They weren't driving. They were coding. And you can see on the right hand side of my screen here. I mean, they are all working together to practice using Sphero. We also, I gave them some um, wrapping paper rolls and toilet paper rolls and just things I had laying around the classroom to kind of make a little maze or a little map um, to just practice driving Sphero around. So it was just something fun for them to do. And then they kind of got to practice with a layout of how do I want to make my map? Um, so you can see this one project, there were so many skills that were being incorporated. We eventually had them measure the distance um, from their stopping points using inches and centimeters. And then we figured out the length difference between two locations. So once you have your engineering project, I think it's easiest to work backwards. So you have your engineering project and then you think to yourself, okay, how can I incorporate reading? How can I incorporate math, science, social studies? And there's... There's so many things. It's just going to come natural to you after probably your second project. 
Um, so these are some different methods for publishing in your classroom. I know that we have all been given a plethora of resources since March. So some of these you might already know and some you might have that you have loved using and that's amazing. But these are all linked for you so that if you want to access these, all you have to do is simply click on the resource and it will take you to it. Um, there are videos and things that you can watch on these. They're typically on the first page of their website if you're unfamiliar with them, um, but they are all linked for you so that if you're having trouble thinking of, okay, well, how can my kids publish using technology? I have two, four, six, 12 of these resources here for you. Um, like I said, I know that we've probably been dealt this times 50. So if you have found something that's working for you, that's amazing. I would just say if you are brand new getting started, Seesaw is a great one because there's a video piece, there's a photo piece, there's a voice recording piece, there's a drawing piece that they can make diagrams. So that's kind of your one-stop shop. If you wanna just go ahead and ease you and your kiddos into it, I would suggest starting with Seesaw. Oh, I'm going backwards here, sorry about that. Okay, now in your classroom, it is important, I think, to have a certain area or areas designated to your STEAM learning. Um, in my classroom in the morning when the students would come in, one station that they would do every morning, I didn't assign actual morning work, they had morning centers, and a STEM center was one of those. So they got to create every, every morning, and there were no stipulations of what they could create. I did have, if you look down here in the bottom center, I did have some of these cards here. If they were having trouble coming up with some ideas of what maybe to build, they could use these cards. And I just left them up all year long, laminated, actually kept them in those little white buckets that are over here. Um, and if I found something seasonal, I would put those in the third bucket, but these two I left out all the time. And they would use them if they wanted to, and they didn't have to if they didn't want to. Um, I got these bins from the dollar store and all of these resources I'm going to talk about in just a second, but the kids, it is amazing how organized they keep these. As you can see, I don't even have mine labeled yet. They've been like that for two and a half years now. Haven't even had them labeled yet. Um, just of course, one of those things haven't gotten around to, but they keep them so organized because they enjoy using them and they want to keep them nice and in good condition. And of course, we have that conversation at the beginning of the year, um, you know, the expectations I have and how it should look and how things should be put away and things like that. Um, but this is just one area in our classroom. It's right between our writing centers um, and kind of our work center over here. If you can see that white table, our writing centers over here to the right. And then this area is just kind of like a free work area. They would sit here a lot of times to do their projects. A lot of the times, so though, they would sit on the floor um, or using this red counter here. But it is important that you have an area um, to kind of promote that STEAM learning. I just put a couple books up here and I used, um, industrial Velcro to hang those shelves on that wall. Uh, I promise I didn't put any holes in there because our maintenance men would probably report me. The fire marshal still isn't happy with me, but we're not gonna get into that. Um, and then I just put some some STEM books up there. I'll, I'd change them out every so often. And then these STEM challenges up here, I would not have the kids use on their own. Uh, this is a resource that I would use, you know, for a whole class STEM project. Um, or something like that. These are great as well. They have seasonal and everyday STEM resources on cards. Um, they're, they're amazing and they have K5 as well. So purchase those on Amazon. I think they were maybe $10. Um, but again, a go-to if you're having trouble coming up with ideas for um, STEAM projects, this is already done for you. Um, and then the white shelf I got from the container store, but you know, of course you can use whatever. It does not have to be expensive and it does not have to be a huge area. Um, so leading into that, these are some of our favorite non-consumable STEM resources. That's probably the biggest um, misconception that people have whenever you start talking about STEAM learning or STEM learning is that, well, it's expensive. How do you get all of those resources? I would suggest asking your school, asking your parents, um, or you yourself. I know that we should not be investing in our classrooms, but we all know that we do. Um, so just pick and choose what you want to do. If there's something that you really like that you want to be able to take with you, if you piece out of there, you know, I would suggest buying it yourself, but trust me, your parents are going to want to support you with STEAM education. So if there's something that you are really looking for, 
I would I would recommend reaching out to your parents, members of the community um, or your administrators, because most of the time they are going to want you to be using STEAM and STEM in your classroom. So they will be in full support of that. So there's my little soapbox deal there. Um, all of these are linked as well. So if you click on the picture, it will take you to the Amazon link where these were all purchased from um, to the individual project product, excuse me. Oops. So um, these are great if you are not looking to spend a whole lot of money because you can use these again and again and again and again. I will say if you're going to start with one, I would start with those plastic straws that are in the bottom right corner. Those things came in a giant pack and I think I was able to split them up into five shoe boxes. So that was that I had at one per table if I needed to. Um, so those were able to be split up like crazy. So if you're going to start with one thing, I would recommend those straws because you can use those for so many things and they bend and you can reference joints um, and things like that. So those guys are amazing. If you want to start somewhere, I would start there. Um, up in the top, I purchased these big storage bins from Ikea. I was trying to find the, the name of them and the product for y'all, but I couldn't for some reason. Um, but they're just these big white tubs and they have plastic drawers. I believe they're for you know, whatever kind of storage, toy storage or whatever. But those um, are great for storing your materials as well. And they're really pretty and they create a workspace as well because they have a flat tabletop. So a uh, lot of birds with one stone there. But these, um, they're, they're consumable, obviously, but they don't have to be. The toilet paper rolls, if you just put out to your parents at the beginning of the year, hey, I'm going to need some toilet paper rolls, um, you will have the rest to last you, last you an entire lifetime. And those are things that you're going to use all the time for certain things. But it's one of those things that you're like, oh, I don't have enough. So I would recommend just asking your parents, send them in as you need them. That's why it's important to have a storage space for that. Otherwise, you're just going to have junk all over your room and it's going to drive you crazy. Okay. So finally, here we are. That's all of my backstory about um, STEAM and kind of how to get it set up in your classroom. So all of these things are ways that we can connect STEAM to children's literature. I just kind of have the running joke that I work to buy picture books and picture books are my second love in between my dogs and my husband um, in that order. I love picture books. I'm obsessed. A lot of my picture books I get on Book Outlet. They're very inexpensive. You can get $18 hardback books for $3. So if you haven't heard of them, I would recommend checking them out because they are amazing. Now, I'm going to go over, um, actually, let me go back one second. So each icon that is listed here, um, you will see on the following slides. So that little rocket ship is going to represent the science, um, how you could incorporate science. The computer, of course, is how you can incorporate technology. The little cross tools is engineering. The art palette, of course, is art. And then our math symbols is, you guessed it, math. So this is how you can take a picture book and incorporate all of these different areas into one project. This is a great book called Dreaming Up. Um, for science, you can replicate and locate famous structures on a map. We're kind of using science and social studies interchangeably here. I should have mentioned that. Um, for technology, you can research information concerning famous landmarks. They can construct the tallest building possible using a given set of materials. So this is where your variable would be the same, where you're giving everyone the same material to use to build. We did this um, with building of a hat. They had three minutes to build the tallest hat possible that was wearable. For art, they could create an informational video explaining how they created their structure. And um, then of course they can measure and compare lengths of their structures for math. So none of these things are crazy complicated. It's just, okay, this is how we're going to incorporate all of these things after using this book. And of course with the book, you can talk about beginning, middle and end, cause and effect, fact and opinion. So once you've done that for your reading lesson, you know, then you can go in at the end of the day and do your engineering project and incorporate all of these things like that. Oh, Rosie Revere Engineer, love this. We were actually fortunate enough that we were able to go see this play last year, um, and it was adorable. So they can read and research various inventions and inventors that interest them. Um, this is great using Pebble Go, perfect resource for that. They can research and explore how machines work. Um, they can engineer a hat with a movable part, just like Rosie's that she made for her aunt. For art, they could create a poster or commercial to advertise their new hat. 
And then of course for math, they could set up an economics fair and sell their invention to others, um, determining cost and supply and demand. I know that that would um, go along with social studies as well, but it's just working with money. Oh, the perfect square. This is a really fun project too. This book is really cute. It's all these different things that they've made out of using a paper square. Um, so they can modify their square to replicate solids, liquids, and gas particles for science. Um, they can use online tangram manipulatives. There's some on ABC Yacht and Toy Theater. They can give, you can give students a piece of construction paper um, and have at it. That's what I did for math. I did not give them any guidelines. I said, you have to use your entire square. I did already have the squares cut, so they were a perfect square because we did this in the beginning of the year. But if I was doing this with older kids, then I would tell them, okay, so we're going to first draw our square. So how, does, how do we know a square is a square? All four sides are equal. Okay, so we're all going to measure our square. We're going to make um, all four sides nine inches or something like that, or 15 centimeters whatever you want to do. So just another way that you can incorporate that math depending on your grade level. Um, they can take a photo of their creation and create a diagram using the drawing and labeling tools on your class seesaw account for art. And then for math, they can determine right angles, quadrilaterals, differences between squares and rectangles. What to do with a box, great project, great book. We did this at the end of, um, we usually do this at the end of the year because it's a fun culminating um, project and it usually is messy and takes a lot of time. So for science, they can create a diorama of an animal habitat or specific landform. So obviously if you didn't guess it, this book is simply where you give them a box and they make something out of it. Um, for technology, they can video their diorama and explain its features, so a little video tour. They can, you can issue students cardboard box to create for engineering, like I mentioned. They can create a, a green screen video of them in their habitat diorama, explaining the features of their habitat. Um, green screen and do ink are really good resources for that. And then of course they can measure the length, height, area, and perimeter of their box. I want a guana, um, oh, I'm sorry, I want a new room if I built a house or a car. All of these are very similar. So you can just simply pick one of these and all of these lessons would fit within one of these books. Um, explore materials that would work best for building a house. Could kind of go along with states of matter. Um, Barbie dream house design online website is great for building a house. I promise even the boys will like it. And then they could do a green screen um, tour of their house. Uh, they could design their dream room, house, or car. They could do that on paper if they wanted to. Um, you know, so it doesn't have to be anything crazy when it comes to engineering. Draw a blueprint for their new design, and then they can make flyers selling their house or their car or their room, um, you know, for an advertisement for art. And then, of course, measurement, cost of materials needed for construction. You could even give them, this is the price for this material, and depending on what they use, they have to figure out the total cost. Depending on your grade level, you can even say, okay, this is how much it is per foot or per inch, and then they'll have to measure and calculate the cost. The Water Princess is a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, this is really, I love this book because it really opens the kids' eyes to having them realize that, oh, wow, so in some places in the world, when they go to turn on the water, nothing comes out. Yeah, they don't even have a faucet in their house. So a lot of them don't realize that. So using nonfiction in these types of children's books um, is connecting to that real world, that those 21st century, um, that 21st century learning that maybe kids don't really realize because they're just kind of in their own little bubble at times, which we all know. Um, so they can read and research about the different parts of the world that do not have clean drinking water. Um, they can record their water filter in use and post um, on Seesaw. So I should have kind of skipped that one to go to the engineering process because or engineering project because they they would design and create a water filter that could purify contaminated water. I did this project for the first time um, for one of my first STEM projects. Like I said, it was probably 11, 12 years ago. Um, and it was so cool to give the kiddos this dirty water and then have them create a filter using rocks and paper. Um, you know, we gave them all sorts of different materials to choose from. Some we knew would work and some we knew wouldn't. Um, and to see the clean drinking water that would come out from their filter, they were over the moon excited. So for that math, you would measure the water that you put in and then measure the water that comes out and figure out how much water um, was kind of caught within your water filter. 
They could illustrate a diagram of their filter by labeling each section of their diagram or their filter. And then of course I said they could measure the amount of liquid before and after throughout. Roller coaster, this is another one we do at the end of the year. They read and research the science behind force and motion for science. They can design, build, and test roller coasters online. There's one called Roller Coaster Creator, and someone even told me that Disney had one. So I thought that was amazing because I love Disney also. They can engineer a roller coaster for a marble to travel through. This is what we used, and we used paper plates and solo cups. Um, and of course, a lot of tape. I think I also offered straws and some popsicle sticks um, for them to create it, but nothing crazy expensive. For art, they could create a marquee or sign for their roller coaster. And then of course they can measure the speed or velocity, um, the distance and the time that it took for their marble to make it around the coaster. Um, and then of course measure how long their, their coasters are. So I have talked way too much. I've already been talking for an hour probably because no one's there to stop me. So thank you. Um, so for these, what I have given to you guys is since you're getting this presentation, I'm not going to spend time going through this. If we were together, I would love for you to look through these picture books um, to kind of get some ideas. But this is a great go-to for if you're wanting to do some STEM education in your room and you're not sure where to start. All you have to do is get these books. So on these next slides, I have some picture books for you and then some ideas that you could use in your classroom. So you can go through the rest of these. Um, during this presentation, you can kind of see some that interest you, some maybe books that you already have, and you could start with those for doing some of these projects. Um, most of these books came from Book Outlet. They were fairly inexpensive. Um, of course, you can check out your library. You can even see if they are online as a video piece. I know that it's always just special for my kiddos and I to sit in our classroom library and to read these books together. Um, so I would recommend doing that but totally get it if you can't do that. This is our Grace Hopper book. Whenever I had mentioned her at the beginning, um, I didn't know who she was until I purchased this book. So I was glad that I did. Of course, we have our pigeon books that everybody loves. Um, so these are just some ideas to get you started if you're having trouble coming up with maybe what to do. If you're really having trouble coming up with some ideas and you're really thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to do this? I would recommend starting with one project a month. You could maybe have it be the first week of the month, middle of the month, whatever you want to do. Just set up a routine so that your kiddos know it's coming and you know it's coming. They'll be excited for it. Trust me. This is kind of a one-stop shop for you um, for each month, the book, and then what you could do for your engineering project. Um, you certainly don't have to do these for your engineering project. You could do whatever you want, but um, this is just a great little way to get you started if you're thinking, I don't really know what to do, what to come up with. Um, here you go. You have your plans. And then all you'll have to do is incorporate your science and your technology, art, math. Um, if we were together, we would be doing this project. However, this is an example of how you could do, um, I'm sorry, how you could present a project to your kiddos. So after you read the book, this book is called 21 Elephants. It's a beautiful story. Um, they would be constructing a bridge that could hold 21 elephants. So a little synopsis, um, this is about the completion of the Brooklyn Bridge. It is a true story. Um, a lot of people were scared to cross this bridge because they didn't know how strong or sturdy it was. So P.T. Barnum actually paraded 21 elephants across this bridge to show people how strong it was. So for your um, project, you could have them, of course, create this bridge, and then you could see for the test if it could hold 21 elephants. Um, and if not, then your test would simply be, well, how many elephants could it hold? So that variable, you would have to keep the same, whatever you're using for your elephants. Um, if you wanted to, you could even combine your um, test and say, okay, well, this weight's going to represent five elephants because it's worth five pounds. And you know, you can kind of work with your kiddos in that way um, just to build upon that creative thinking. Um, so what I would suggest is just having your kiddos, I already gave you guys the synopsis of the story, um, but you could have slides like this to present to your class and it kind of walks them through, at least for your first project or two, 
after that, they're going to be so ready to get started and they already know the process that you will not we need to waste time making slides or things like that. Um, but just for this project, some background information they would need to have, analyze different types of bridge designs, the trusses, suspension, and arch, um, which I had mentioned that we did for Wizard of Oz. So the vocabulary that they would need would, would you know, you can pick out your vocabulary depending on the book and your class, of course, but um, deck, abutments, welds, bolts, rivets, span, and structure. You know, they need to learn what all of those words are. So that's a great vocabulary lesson as well. And then, of course, you want to remind them to go through the engineering process. You could create, um, complete the ask and imagine sections together as a class. And then, of course, they would create their, their plan either alone or with a partner. And then of course the creation and testing and improvement phases. You could always have them do the improvement section on their own too, um, because what I would want to improve might be something from different from my partner. But I do think it's important if they're working in a group that they are talking about these things together. So these are some materials that I had them choose from, popsicle sticks, yarn, construction paper, tape, cups, and straws. I did let them use whatever they wanted. Um, for their bridge, I didn't say you can only choose two materials or three materials. You can certainly put restrictions on that if you'd like to. It's totally how you want this to work in your classroom. Um, but I just tried to put less stipulations on it um, because I didn't want to kind of limit their creativity, if that makes sense. Um, but at times, depending on the project, there certainly might be something that you're like, okay, they're not using everything. And they'll learn that it's not about quantity, it's about quality. So yeah, you might be choosing all of these things, but number one, we're not going to be wasteful. And number two, just because you're using all of these things doesn't mean your bridge is going to be sturdy and it's going to be successful. And they will learn that. It might take a project or two, but they certainly will learn that. I had them determine which type of bridge that they would be mimicking. I wanted to see, was it a truss, an arch, or a suspension bridge? Um, so again, they had to recreate, so they were making those connections of what that bridge was, how it was built, the features of that bridge. So that was all part of the imagining process. This was the graphic organizer that I gave them. Um, we, of course, created, or I'm sorry, completed the Imagine section together. We actually did that during literacy whenever we read this story, um, and we filled out the vocabulary together. Um, so this isn't something that's necessarily done in a, in a class period and certainly something that's not completed over one day. It is important that you kind of talk with your kiddos and say, okay, so by the end of class today, I want everyone to have their plan completed um, so that they know, okay, I need to focus on this one area. And then it's helpful if you start the creation part, like I said, depending on the project, but it's um, beneficial if you do the creation part maybe the next day so that you have time to prepare your materials and figure out how you're going to get them set up. I thought that it was easiest to have just things on my round table and then I let them come up as their group once they were done um, with whatever I gave them to work on before that. Um, and then they could gather their materials and find a spot in the room and have at it. So you can see this one, this plan is more detailed. It has a lot more guiding questions um, to it in my present and test section here. You can see that I put my math in there. So it's totally up to you with how you want to do these. Sometimes you'll just have them do it on the back. Sometimes you'll talk about it. Sometimes they'll do the math on Seesaw or whatever it is that they're publishing. So it's going to be different for all teachers and grade levels, and you're just going to make it work for you. Now I'm rambling. Um, and then of course we want them to carry out their plan. You're going to test it. It's fun whenever you test it as a whole class. Um, and you know, you do have to have that conversation with them the first project or two about, um, you know, if someone's project is not successful, this is not a time that we laugh about that or put that down. You know, we're not teasing people if their designs weren't um, successful. And, and they won't, they won't. They'll realize, okay, yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't want someone to do that to me. Um, so they won't, that will not be a problem. But I do think that it should be something that is discussed with your kiddos. So now that I have rambled on for one hour and eight minutes, um, I hope it was good rambling though. You are going to be able to click to download all of these engineering design plans. If you click on it, you will see the link come up. Mine is down here at the bottom because I'm presenting my screen. But whenever you are looking at this on Google Slides and you hover over it, you will be able to click and download. So these guys are already done, already made for you. Some of these I went over and some of them I didn't. Um, 
This first one here is your generic plan. So this is a great way to start. Um, I have your gingerbread man loose at the zoo, some um, fairy tale plans. This one has multiple plans in them um, because of course our fairy tale unit was one of our favorites through the year. Millie's chickens is an excellent one. This is a hybrid animal creation, um, which was on one of the picture books that I just kind of skimmed over. Um, what to do with a box engineering plan, our roller coaster, and then of course the bridge. And that one also has a couple um, variations of it as well for you. So all of these are yours as a little thank you parting gift for attending. And I think it's going to be really beneficial to get you guys up and running with STEAM in your classroom. So hopefully this makes you feel a little bit more at ease um, and excited to start STEM in your classroom. So if you are doing any of these things in your classroom, I would love to see what they are. So I have my email address here for you. You can tag me on Twitter. And then I have my Instagram as well, because I would love to see your projects that you're doing. Um, and this is just a great way for all of us to share. So feel free to reach out to me on any of these platforms. Um, even if you have a question, I'm happy to share um, any information that I can to help you guys. So please reach out please reach out. Also want to leave you with this. Creating content is the ultimate in demonstrating understanding. This is huge for those non-believers. So if you have any non-believers in your school, please share with them. Yes, I know we have content to get through. I know we have curriculum to get through. But creating is the ultimate in understanding. So thank you guys so, so much for attending. I so wish that we could have done this in person. I hope for the 2021 conference that life is back to normal. We can all be in a room together sharing ideas and, and really talking about STEAM. Um, there is a survey link here. If you could please complete that for me, all you have to do is click on it. And again, the link will pop up. It is a very, very short survey. Um, so please, if you could complete that, I would really appreciate it. So thank you guys so much. Again, I hope that you learned so much or at least something that you didn't know before you came here. Um, and you are going to get started with STEAM in your classrooms. So enjoy. Again, thank you so much. And full STEAM ahead.